The most important part of the drawing is the proportion and most importantly the envelope which contains the height and width of the subject. If this bounding envelope is wrong you will end up with a drawing that is either too wide or too narrow so really pay close attention to this. This cast is pretty straightforward as it is almost a perfect square. I like to add little indications that I know to be too wide or too narrow. It just gives me a visual check. And it's much easier to solve a visual problem like drawing visually rather than figuring it out in your head. Once the envelope is established, the block-in can be found. The initial block-in should find the silhouette. The silhouette of this cast won't give us much insight into its shape and form, but it is important to establish the big proportional guidelines early on. I like to think of this stage as being like a sculptor carving into clay or marble. The idea here is to capture the form in big simple lines, not dwelling on any small details. To help with this, you can see I'm creating long sweeping lines with the movement from my elbow and not small scratchy lines. I'm checking to see where this point sits in relation to the top of the envelope and the bottom as it will be used to place in the initial shadow shaped lines. It is really important to check every point at this stage because we'll be using them to develop the rest of the drawing. So if they are wrong, now it's a lot of work to adjust later on. So always moving around this initial block in, making any adjustments that I see and importantly removing any old lines that aren't needed anymore. Don't worry about smaller lines as willow charcoal isn't very good at these small details. Just think of the big forms when using willow. Before starting the value stage, it can be really useful to create a tiny thumbnail. This captures the core elements of the values, but only think in two values. As you can see by simplifying the subject like this, it actually becomes relatively easy. As we basically have two light shapes, a dark shape in the middle, with just a small little squashed square shape of light within that dark. So I recommend getting into the habit of creating these little thumbnail sketches especially useful when thinking about composition of a subject. A great way of checking this is by blurring your eyes as well, like I've done with the image here. And it gets rid of all those small pieces of information and detail, and you just see the big, simple design, which is all you're really trying to go for at this stage. This drawing is the same drawing I would draw at a thumbnail size to a full-size figure drawing. You're looking for this strong impact or capture the viewer's attention. If you can capture it early on, you really stand a good chance of creating a strong drawing. When I start on the full-size drawing, I use this same approach at first, finding the long lines and not worrying about small details like those along the top of the eyebrow. This simple shape allowed me to spot that the light shape at the top of the eye was too small and needed to be adjusted. Keeping these shapes simple will allow you to spot problems like that easily. So instead of worrying about it being a detailed eyebrow, it's just a simple geometric shape. Again, ignoring the fact I'm drawing an eye, just simplifying this form at first. And you'll hear me say simplify over and over because that way you won't easily get lost in all the detail and lose the important big proportions. This is why this method is called the visual abstraction, as you have to abstract and simplify the subject. In this case, down to three sections, two light shapes and one dark. You will agree these are far easier to think about than drawing an eye. Just remember, make your life easier at first and not harder. Drawing is hard enough. Once I'm happy with the big shapes and proportion, I place in small indications for the left and the right of the eye, and a small indication for the bottom of the lower eyelid. These aren't necessarily shadow shapes, but help guide me in the decision-making process. It actually tells you a lot about the width of the eye, comparing the indication to the left and right 
of the extremes and then the height of the eye, looking at the space between the lowest point of the eye and the bottom of the cast. Also how the outside of the eye sits higher up than the interior. I also map in the simple cast shadow of the cast. This helps visualize it as a subject within an environment and not floating. And then finally quickly indicating that, that light shape within the big dark shadow. Not too worried about the exact shape at the moment either. After this, you can start to develop the form and the shadow shapes. When drawing the eye of this cast, it is important to think of it as a big, simple ball, ignoring the dark shape for the pupils. Remember this all comes down to simplifying what you're seeing. Removing the pupil allows me to see the big shadow along the eye. It makes the process of understanding the form a little easier. Like for example how the form of the eyebrow is casting its shadow down onto the ball of the eye. And then as the form of the eye turns away, we get that form shadow. Keep using Willow Charcoal for this, as even though it's not the neatest of mediums, it will allow you to make adjustments easily. I've also placed in a dark for the bottom lid. Although this doesn't seem like a dark, I want to keep in mind that the eye is a ball, and so a rounded surface, with the lower lid curving away from the light source. As you've got to remember that the lids follow the geometry of the eye, and as we now know, the eye is a ball. It is important to remember that line is purely a proportion and scaffolding for the drawing, and it's the mass or tone that will do the majority of the work. Think of line as a mannequin. It's only there for the clothes to be draped over the top or for the shadow shapes to be put over the top. Look how I kept everything in straight lines, think in angles. Straight lines are much easier to see when you need adjustments, whereas curves are very difficult. And at this stage, it's all about finding correct proportion. Before long, I want to mass it all into two values using the side of the willow charcoal. Be very strict with yourself here. Don't get caught in the darks or don't find information in the darks. There's a wealth of information within there, but we have to simplify it. What we are doing is establishing our value families. We are finding our light family and we are finding our dark family with no individual value. Also, keeping our edges firm. Because if a drawing doesn't work in two values with these strong edges, then the shapes are wrong and they need adjusting. And you can see here by these examples that you recognize these portraits without the need for lots of information and detail. So it tells you a lot about the information you need compared to the information you think you need. So it's important to point out that there are literally tens of thousands of values our eyes can see, but in charcoal as a medium, we realistically have about nine. So chasing every value you see, it isn't possible, but luckily nine values is all you really ever need. By finding this strong design in two values, it will give you a drawing that will feel structural and solid. Once you place your drawing within mass or tone, mistakes tend to make themselves a little bit more obvious. That's because our eyes see in mass, we don't see in line. So try to avoid hanging around in line for too long. And once the charcoal is massed in, then use the stump to force it into the tooth of the paper. I may end up losing some of my shapes doing this, but I'm going to be going back over them, making any corrections and adjustments needed, using the eraser as a drawing tool. This will lighten the value, but remember, don't worry about finding the darkest value you can. This is really because the darkest value in a subject is often not the most common. And the value of the stumped in charcoal is at three to four, which is the high end of the darks. 
and so if you keep erasing the darks, it will easily make them too light. Keeping your darks as simple as well allows you to check proportions and placements of shapes without being overwhelmed by detail in value. I spend a long time at this stage really going around and checking all of my shapes are working, especially proportion. It's a good time to step away from your drawing, see it from far away. Don't get stuck at the easel, but it's very difficult to see problems if you're fixated on one small area. This stage can often take many hours of work, depending on how complex the subject is. Simplifying something is often much harder than it looks. Remember, this is because you're abstracting reality and not merely copying it. But try not to start a drawing again without solving problems. This is quite a common process people do when they don't like a drawing. But if you haven't solved a problem, you're bound to make the same mistake again. So if needed, take a break. We'll come back to it. I can see my initial placement of the light shape within the dark was definitely too small. And I'm comparing where the shadow shape ends on the eye and that gap created. So using my kneaded razor, it's a case of just slowly bringing it down. Don't beat yourself up though if you see mistakes like this. The whole point of starting simply is the fact that you can make these adjustments. Remember drawing is a process of correcting mistakes, not about never making any in the first place. Once these big shadow shapes are in, finding small shapes like the pupil for the eye can be useful. In this case, it helps me check the progress of the drawing. And I can see that I'm along the right track. All the time though, at this point, keeping values just to two and your edges firm, as it will allow you to make observations about proportion and accuracy of shapes. It's very easy to start to lose your shape when using charcoal and things become smudgy or lost and undefined, and you really want to try and avoid that. So be really disciplined in continually in correcting your shapes. At this stage, it really is about checking and double checking all the proportions of the shapes. It's just like the foundations of a building. Once they are set, there's no easy way of adjusting them afterwards. If you make the walls of a living room too small, no fancy wallpaper is ever gonna fundamentally change that. I like to go around with the stump and make any subtle adjustments that are needed, like underneath the eye and the ball for the eye itself. I was finding the dark for the pupil unhelpful at this stage as it was kind of getting in the way and creating a bit of a mess and not really useful for finding the big shape of the eye so I remove it and we'll probably add it in later on. Sometimes in a drawing you have to think in layers rather than to try to draw around a small area like the pupil it was far easier to remove it for now and find it later. Sometimes a drawing is really a lost and found process. You're adding and taking away all the time. It's never a linear process. Now you can see here, I'm using the stump of my finger to soften some of the darks. Starting with this shadow under the eye, 
as if you remember, this isn't really a shadow shape, more of a dark within the light, which is really soft in edge and subtle in value. What I'm being really careful of here is finding that gentle curve of the light hitting that lower lid. Making sure I'm getting it curving all the way up. Remember, the outside of the eye sits higher up than the interior. Never rushing to get past this proportional stage. In fact, you never really get past proportion. You're always continually going back and checking everything. Next, I like to find a value everywhere within the lights. Just using the charcoal on my stump, not trying to find a very dark value. Sometimes you will need to use your finger just to soften out any unwanted dark patches that the stump makes. This again falls into the principle of simplifying the subject. As I know that the value of the paper is my highest light or my highlights, and the highlights in the subject are actually very subtle, because plaster has lots of tiny porous holes, it is a good approximation of skin, so all the highlights will be super subtle, unlike a shiny object, which has highlights with very crisp edges and a strong contrast between it and the local value. So by adding this value everywhere within the lights, I'm giving myself the ability to remove for the highlights later on instead of trying to work around them or saving them. This comes back to that idea of thinking in layers. So removing that top value, as these are not often the most common. In fact, the majority of the subjects the midtone tends to be the most common. So finding this nice consistent value within the lights will act as a nice unifier for the whole scene. And this happens a lot where lights become patchy because there isn't a value to unify them all together. You can see though, even though I'm finding a light value, I'm still making sure that my shadow shapes remain clear. Take as long as you need to get this nice uniform value. Sometimes you'll have to pick up some charcoal from somewhere else to add it to the stump. Just remember that you're not trying to get a dark value here. It's important at this stage that I try and remove any unneeded scaffolding lines or proportional lines as I'm trying to move away from the idea of a linear drawing now to one of mass. And that's really what will make a drawing stand out. But using a bit more charcoal on my stump, this time to show how the bottom left turns away slightly from the lights. Using my stump for this will allow me to create a really nice subtle edge and value, avoiding any unwanted hard edges, which can be really common if you go straight in with Willow or General's pencils. It just gives that really nice gradation. As I have stumped the charcoal into the tooth of the paper, the value was raised. And because I want the cast to stand out slightly more, because its local value is white, the overall value range will be quite light. And so I have two options. I can try and lighten the lights, but this of course is almost impossible now. So the best way of making the cast seem lighter is to make the cast shadows darker. And straight away you can see how the cast jumps out from the page. At all times though I'm going back to the first stage and thinking about the proportion and shapes of the subject consistently. Checking relations between them. Drawings don't have a save button. So even though you've got it right once doesn't mean that it will stay correct forever. What I always like to do is go back around and check my big shapes are still working. Kind of reconnecting with the proportion. I also want to just darken the bottom right of the cast as well so I can see it slowly turning away from the light source slightly. 
When developing forms in the light, unifying is key, making sure the values don't become separated from each other or too extreme. So I use my fingers a lot to even out uneven values. If someone starts becoming like they're a chimney sweep, it's a pretty good indication that the values in the lights have become too separated from each other. As I develop these lights, I'm trying to see how the forms are turning and importantly where the light source is coming from. Here we have the form of the eyebrow slowly turning away from the lights. The tricky part is turning the forms without losing the big shapes. And I find I often have to go back to the big shapes, re-add them with the willow charcoal and then try and soften them again. I end up jumping around a lot between using the stump and the charcoal and I find this is really just part of the whole drawing process. It also slowly builds up the subtle tones and edges that I'm looking for. I like to try and have a play in the drawing between areas of tight rendering and looser areas like on the cast shadow as it gives a really nice juxtaposition and play within the composition. Every now and again, I step away from the drawing and try and see it from the other side of the room, making sure the big design and composition is working. Go back to the idea of the thumbnail sketch. Even though developing within the lights, I find if my core shadow shapes become lost, I'd always go back and find them again by re-establishing the big shapes. I really want to try and get the sense of that top of the eye and the eyebrow especially turning away from the light source. So it's a case of using the stump, slowly push and turn the forms. Especially that shadow shape on the top left within the lights. Using the stump exclusively, it's a really soft shape. When you're trying to find the correct edge for something, judge it against the hardest edge. And for that, maybe compare the top of the light shape within the dark shape and compare the edge of that to the edge of this dark shape within the lights. And you can see just how soft that shape is. Try and create a scale in your mind as it gives you a point of reference to use. It's really important not to over exaggerate the values or edges of these darks in the lights as they are still very much in the lights. So I tend to err on the side of caution and over soften them. I really want to get the sense of the eye being a ball and a round object. So finding the subtle darks along the lower lid definitely helps. Remember the eye is a strong structural element, especially in classical Greek sculptures. They really exaggerate this sense of the lid wrapping over the ball of the eye. So it's something I really want to try and hold on to. Once the main shadows have been established in Willow, and I know there aren't any more major adjustments, start to use the 2B General's Pencil. Just to define the initial shadow shapes. This kind of cements the shadow shapes on the paper. I 
using the stump to force that charcoal into the tooth. Really taking my time here again, I'm kind of just re-going over the whole drawing. Double checking any problems, because there will be something that I've missed. Once I'm happy with that, I go over the whole shadow shape area. Remember, just using the side of the pencil to create the most even tone possible. Of course, though, using the stump to force the charcoal into the tooth of the paper. My main aim at this stage is to create unity within the drawing and the values. Now working along the edge of the shadows will mean that I won't lose the shape completely. And just using the needed eraser here to find the idea of highlights on the ball of the eye really showing that it's a rounded form. The General's Pencils, as well as being slightly more permanent, allows me to develop some of the slightly more nuanced, smaller elements of the shadows, like the cast shadow along the top of the eyeball itself and the darks on the lower lid. you can start to see how the forms are taking shape. This is done in just these small adjustments, continually tweaking the whole area. never rushing this either. And you can see I'm always working around the drawing, making sure one side always works with the other. At all times though, I'm still just thinking about that idea of the big statement making sure there is a correct distinction between the lights and the darks. Which is something that can be easily forgotten in the advanced stages of a drawing. When working with dark shape within the lights, I'm almost exclusively using a HB. This means I don't accidentally make anything too dark.
and again goes back to that initial thumbnail sketch, keeping in mind the big tonal design. Whenever I'm using a needed eraser in the lights, I'm careful not to press too hard or take off too much. As I don't want it to go back to the white of the paper, but keeping that harmony and unity of tone within the drawing. And to achieve this every now and again, I use the stump just to brush a tone over all the lights or use my finger just to soften all the edges. Remember though, if you start to get lost in a drawing, take it back to a simplified version. It's more important that your big design is always working rather than finding any small subtle detail. Unfortunately, it's not the amount of cherries you put on the top of the cake, but really the amount of work that you put into the preparation. You can see as well, I'm using really light touches the whole time. There's no time limit for how long a drawing should take. Take as long as you need. Again, I'm really trying to find the sense of this eye being a ball and just slowly adjusting that light shape along the lower lid. Sometimes it can take a really long time to see where these adjustments should take place. But never stop for too long in one place. You're kind of constantly moving your eye around the whole drawing. This is why drawing can be such a tiring process as you're really concentrating for the whole period. really wanted to get the sense of the eyeball being on a plane further back from the eyebrow 
That was really a case of then just adding a slightly darker value onto the eyeball itself. Remember, we're only working in two dimensions. And so we have to use value to show what's coming towards us and what's going away. So in this case, I want the top of the eye and the area above the eyebrow to be standing out and the rest of the eye to be receding. So I know that that area along the eyebrow should be lighter than the eyeball. When developing the darks under the eye especially, I really want to make sure that I'm not making them too dark or too hard in terms of their edges. So I tend to over soften them just to be sure using my finger. It's very easy to isolate an area when drawing and see it as the darkest area or the area with the hardest edges, but find a place that you can go back and compare to. When using the stump, don't be tempted to press too hard. It's a case of gradually adding charcoal, that idea of the additive way of drawing as opposed to the subtractive way of drawing. It's a bit like graphite. It's a slow building up of the medium. I can start to see within this process, just slowly adjusting the shapes that the eye is really starting to take shape and feel like a rounded surface. But again, just like the eyeball itself, the light shape above the eye was starting to stand out a little bit too much and I really wanted that area to recede back. So constantly removing information that I've just put in. It's always tempting to add without comparing it to the big design. But a great way of judging this is by blurring your eyes and you can do that really easily and as soon as you do it you can see how the top left of the plaster cast really stands out compared to everything else. So no matter how much I want to, I know that everything else has to be secondary to this. Otherwise I won't get the effect I want. even though the tendency is to think that more information will lead to a better drawing. You can see as well that most of the drawing was done in the first 10-15 minutes and the large majority of it is just making these small subtle adjustments. It's that saying 80% of the work is done in 20% of the time. So just be careful and make sure that your values are still nice and unified. Don't find patchy areas of light and dark. Keep everything simple. That's something that I really can't stress enough. If you think you simplified something, then you might want to do it a little bit more and you might be on the right track. 
Here I'm just using the General's pencil within the darks, but straight away you can see I use the stump to blend that charcoal into the value, keep everything unified. I've learned from past experience that spending an extra five, 10 minutes in an area and knowing it's correct or being 110% sure it's correct is better than rushing past it and realizing you've got a problem later on. So I'm never in any rush to get onto the small details. It's useful here to use a mirror to check that your proportions are still working and nothing has become distorted. And more information on the mirror and the use of the mirror and how it can improve your drawing can be found in the other videos. The idea of it is to hold it up to the side of your head and turning away at about a 45 degree angle from your drawing and subject you want to be able to look through the mirror so you can see your drawing and the subject in the same field of view. And this will kind of flip the image, allowing you to see it again for the first time and spot mistakes. Cool, so now that the large mass for the eye has been found, I can start to add the darks for the pupil. Again, just with one value and using the stump to blend it in. Doing it this way makes the pupil feel like it's part of the eye and there is nice harmonious value running all the way through it. As you can see, just adding in that simple dark really creates that illusion of forms being in a sphere. Using the eraser then just to remove that small area for the light at the bottom of the pupil. As you can see now, this drawing is really starting to take shape. Most importantly, taking shape without the need for any information within the darks. In fact, look at the paintings by Rembrandt especially. You can really see how he took that to extremes, the idea of losing information in the darks, and he creates an amazing sense of depth and mystery. I'm starting to be quite happy with the shape of the eye. I don't want to spend too long working in one area though because you tend to lose sight of any corrections or more importantly any problems you might have. And at the moment there's a lot of subtle rendering going on. I just want to juxtapose that with some nice loose information in the cast shadow. So using Willow, just going to find some loose shapes. This helps create that idea of focus. I just want to make sure that I'm finding the edges of the cast shadow just slightly softer as they're not that hard. But actually by softening this it helps lose them into the background and then the plaster cast itself comes forwards. Using a really dark 4 or 6B General's charcoal pencil just going to use it to create some really nice deep rich darks for the cast shadow and you can really see how it starts to make the cast pop 
and gives a great sense of three dimensions to the form. Starting now to play with the idea of finding different values within the darks, but just big shapes. No small information like in the eyelids, in the darks, or anything like that. Using the stump after this, just to unify all the charcoal within this area. I don't have too much information within the background, and so unifying like this will help keep the balance between the two. And the background serves as a springboard for the smaller, more interesting information within the actual cast itself. To create a realistic drawing, it is important to create a background value around the subject. This is because the white of the paper is my highest light, and that highest light is only found on the cast itself. So in order to create a drawing that feels real, creating an environment for the subject is really important. You can see in these examples of drawings by Sargent that we remove the background, the drawing immediately loses some of its strength. So using willow on its side, I just lightly add large areas all over the background. Then using my thumb to blend it all together. As I said earlier, it's really useful to unify the dark so the viewer's eye doesn't get distracted by too much variation. And you can see that as well in Sargent's drawings. I was always kept the darks unified. And I keep going until I can start to see the cast come out from the background and towards me. You can judge the value of this background by comparing it to the darks of the cast shadow and the local value of the cast itself. Using this value chart is kind of obvious where it sits. But often it's a case of adding in information and thinking, is that too light or too dark? Don't worry if you don't get it right straight away, especially in charcoal. It's a case of slowly doing this. So I go over once, think to myself, is it too light, too dark? Most importantly though, that the background remained unified and simple. Here, instead of using a stump, I use the side of my thumb to unify the charcoal. This tends to create a slightly more even effect. To start to find some of the darker tone closer to the cast at the top, I'm using HB General's pencil. 
really lightly. You can see I'm just holding it at the very end, so there's almost no pressure from me. The last thing I want to do at this stage is scar the paper with an area that I don't want. So I'm being super careful, holding it at the very end and just really lightly finding a slightly darker value. Really making sure to rub it into the tooth of the paper. This now is starting to create a really nice background. You can see the difference a background actually makes from just a few minutes ago. Remember though, the big shadow shapes and design of your drawing should always remain visible and not lost. That's really the most important element of your whole drawing. Now I have all the major elements of the drawing mapped in with a simple tone for each. It now helps me see how I can develop the drawing together. This way of drawing helps me visualise a finished drawing and make adjustments where needed, rather than working in a piecemeal fashion, which I think often limits the development of a drawing, as you can't see the whole drawing being developed together. And you can only see if it works at the very end, whereas this way really allows you to see something being developed. Just going back over with the 4B pencil in the cast shadow, just knocking down the value again. I really want this cast shadow to really stand out as the darkest dark. It's only now, almost an hour into the drawing, that I would start to develop the values within the darks. It's important to remember that the lights within the darks aren't actually that light. And by selecting the lightest value within the dark, this reflected light, we can actually see it's far darker than anything within the lights. So I've got to think to myself, if I want to make something lighter, it is far better to make everything else around it darker. This way I protect the relationship between the lights and the darks. So to find the reflected light above the eye, I start to darken the value above and below it. And quite quickly the shape of the eye within the dark starts to develop. Really important though that there are no hard edges found within the darks. This is because hard edges are only created when form turns away from the light source. And if it's already turned away from the light source, then there can be no hard edge. That's really a fundamental rule and it's something that you should always stick with. I'm always really careful when adding information in the darks, especially with General's pencils, because once it's in, it doesn't come out easily.
A useful design tool within the darks is to not add everything you see, but to keep the idea of the darks being out of focus and the lights being in focus. So I only ever really offer hints at what's within the dark, which strangely enough tends to be a slightly more realistic approach to drawing within the darks. If I do use the kneaded eraser in the darks, I make sure straight away to put charcoal back over the area to unify all those darks again, either using my finger or the stump. But you can see just this suggestion of detail in the darks is already starting to create quite convincing forms, kind of getting the sense of an eyelid within the darks. But just be really careful when adding information in the darks, keep stepping back and seeing the drawing from a distance, as it's really easy to make things look too dark or lose the overall shape if you aren't careful. And because there aren't any strong edges within the dark, it's very easy to lose proportion. And don't get sucked into finding the lights within the darks. Always keep relating them to the actual lights looking again at the comparison between the reflected light and the actual lights and those to a nine value scale. This helps keep everything within relation. I'd say nine, nine and a half times out of 10 problem in a student's work will be that they've made the darks too light or they've lost the unity within the darks. This process of finding the darks does take a while, a lot longer than the lights, as the changes in value and edge are just so much more subtle within the darks than within the lights. So I'm really not worried about rushing this stage or finishing it. 
going to be a case of adding and removing information until visually it's correct. Because I can't know if something is going to work until I put it on the paper. And sometimes you can spend ages on an area trying to get it to work and really the best option is to remove it completely. Remember you don't have to try and say everything that you see. Just see here that I'm going in with the 2B General's Pencil and actually darkening the whole of the dark shape. I don't want the information that I've just put in for the darks to start to stand out too much. And I think actually when I'm comparing the shadow shape to the light shapes, they were starting to get a bit too close in value. Again, it comes back to that idea of unifying and that unifying factor within your drawing. Drawing can often be a really slow, methodical process, especially when dealing with a subject like an eye, where any mistake is really obvious. So I find it better to take a little longer getting an accurate drawing rather than rushing in and finding out I have to go back and make lots of adjustments at the end, which is never very fun. Try and take frequent breaks as well. As your eye can often go stale when you stop seeing problems, which is the reason why sometimes when you come back into your studio or drawing environment and look at your drawing again, a mistake will jump out at you. It's a bit like driving, you know, it's not recommended to continuously drive for long periods. You start to lose concentration. Although the consequences of drawing compared to driving are slightly less severe. But still, try and take a break at least once every 40 minutes or so. You can see I'm kind of using the kneaded eraser then almost straight away rubbing charcoal back over the top. So I know the difference in value in the darks can come down to you know a quarter of a value or fifth of a value. When you're drawing I recommend turning off your phone or putting it on silent and turning around any clock that you have. Try and remove any distractions that get in the way of you trying to get to a finish as opposed to finishing a drawing. And you don't want the distraction of rushing to get to an end. It should be a natural process. It shouldn't be about finishing a drawing in two hours or three hours. Otherwise, you know, when you, if you go to the Sistine Chapel, you wouldn't look at the ceiling and said, oh, but you know, it took, it took him seven years. So what's the point? Time is really an irrelevant factor in drawing. What's more important is getting a good finish. 
I'm adding another layer of willow charcoal to the cast shadow just to really make the drawing stand out and keep those darks working as what can happen is sometimes when you rest your finger or hand on the cast shadow charcoal starts to get removed so all the time I'm thinking about how to harmonize and in a certain way always simplifying the drawing never try and find all the information I see that's the great thing about being able to draw or paint or actually being a visual artist in general is the ability to choose what you want to show the viewer like the background here for example I've just knocked it down in value slightly not because it's like that in real life but because I think it really brings the plaster cast out We can compare the drawing now to the drawing previously without any information in the darks after quite a lot of work and we can see there hasn't really been any major change to the structure of the drawing. It is still all working within this big framework of proportion, shapes, edges and values. Which is easy to forget in the advanced stages of a drawing but always rely on those four pillars of drawing to guide you. Think in terms of proportion first, then think in terms of shapes, then start to see where you can soften these shapes to find your cast edges and form edges, and then think in terms of values. It is easy to find too many values or separate values within the dark. So every now and again, I do like to go over the whole area with a HB. It doesn't add much charcoal, but softens the edges and just puts a simple tone unifying that whole area. What I think is important, especially when drawing the eye, is to avoid having a continuous hard line of either light or dark running around the whole of the eye, top or bottom. This will start to make your eye again feel like an almond shape and flatten out the form. Try and lose some edges. and using the HB in the background as well, creating subtle cross hatching. Can be really easy to get frustrated here and press too hard, but that can scar the paper and create marks where you don't want them, especially within the background. You end up ruining work. So try and learn not to rush this step as the aim is to create a nice even tone.
again, I'm just going back over the whole plaster cast with a HB pencil. As I said before, this is quite a hard pencil, so it doesn't add much in the way of value. It just unifies everything together. It gives that kind of nice soft focus effect. I want to start to think about finding maybe more details within the top of the eyebrow. And to find this, especially the small hair in the eyebrow, I use charcoal just on the stump, as this alone will create a dark enough value along with the subtle edges that I'm looking for. Just to give the illusion of form. I like to find some really nice crisp edges, especially along the edge of the cast to create the feeling that the cast is a strong angular box-like form and helps separate the plaster cast from the background. Since I'm doing this, this kind of brings out that cast from the back. Here, I'm starting to add that small dark line for the edge of the iris, but I'm being really careful only to use super light touches, as it isn't a particularly strong shape, nor is it dark in value or strong in edge. So I don't want a dark line to overpower the other elements of the eye. Here, I've just added in the reflected light in the dark side and the shape of the eyeball, being really careful there not to make it too light, to always thinking in terms of value families, or my darks and my lights, and making sure those don't get confused. I felt again that I could probably lower the value of the background just to really bring out the lights within the cast itself. Creating that really nice strong focal point.
Now that the drawing is almost complete, it is a chance to start to develop some of the really subtle shapes, like the tear duct, and refining what's already been found. I often find the last third of any drawing is simply adjusting what's already there, and a lot of cases removing unneeded information and distractions from the big statement. I always have this big initial statement in the back of my mind when I'm drawing, as it's the structure of the whole drawing, and every adjustment, no matter how major or minor, will be adjusted against if it is in keeping with that big statement. Now we are moving towards the end of the drawing, it is a good time to talk about lighting a subject matter. More importantly, natural lighting versus what we are using here, artificial lighting, along with the pros and cons of each. Artificial light is a great way of introducing the student to the fundamentals of drawing. It is the light source that many art schools favour for a student's first piece of work. There are many reasons for this. Mainly, the light shapes and shadow shapes on a subject lit with artificial light are far easier to recognise and understand visually, and allows the student to really see what is going on within the form. In this cast, the artificial light has allowed us to see how the light source illuminates the fact that the eye is a ball. As artificial light is usually much stronger than natural light, values become much simpler, as the lights are lighter and the darks are much darker, with the midtones being somewhat blown out. Meaning the act of simplifying the subject becomes a lot easier. Here is an example of a plaster cast lit with a very strong light, maybe too strong, as all we have left is the core darks and just one light with the highlights being completely lost. This can be the danger of using artificial light that is too strong. Another advantage of artificial light is its versatility. We can move it around and create any number of interesting compositions and designs. Using this plaster cast of a figure, we can see the diversity of drawing options available to the artist by simply moving the artificial light source around the subject. 
from this a very strong overhead lighting which allows the artist to really push their values and create imposing and dramatic effects playing on the strong edges and darks created all the way to much flatter front lighting and pretty much anything in between allowing the artist to really test their material handling techniques and also make the most out of a limited number of plaster casts they may have due to the range of lighting options available to you with artificial light. As natural light is normally from a single source like a window, the options are far more limited in this respect. Taking the same plaster cast we are drawing and lighting it under natural light, it becomes clear how the forms are much harder to read and understand. And if this was a beginner student's first plaster cast drawing, they might not realise how the eyebrow sits over the eye. Understanding the fundamentals of shadow, including form and cast edges, become impossible for the beginner due to the amount of ambient light bouncing around. But on the other side of this, as the lighting is far less intense, subtle forms become much more apparent, like along the eyebrow. Comparing the darkest darks and highest lights of the same cast lit both naturally and artificially, it is clear how the range of values in the naturally lit cast is far more limited than the artificially lit cast. Natural light therefore tends to be reserved for more advanced students, wishing to test their dexterity and material handling. A superb example of this is the cast drawing completed by John Singer Sargent in 1877, while studying at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, winning, unsurprisingly, the top prize the school can give. Here is a picture of the exact same cast Sargent drew, and you can see how the natural lighting means there is very little in the way of strong darks, with all the values being very close together. Of course, artificial light isn't just for beginners, and natural light isn't just for advanced artists, but it comes down to what you want the drawing or painting to say and importantly what areas of drawing you wish to focus on. If it's big design shapes and composition, or if it's material handling and subtle turning of forms, being able to master both will be key to your success. So always practice the thing you feel least comfortable with, which is often much easier said than done, but always push yourself as that is where you'll grow as an artist. As mentioned earlier, the goal of this drawing is not to create a photorealistic copy, but a drawing that has life to it and engages with the viewer, which is far harder than photorealism as he has to make judgments on what to keep and what to remove. That's the beauty of drawing. Everyone will have their own idea about what a finished drawing is, and even within the same subject, the results can vary hugely. Almost like handwriting, people's natural thought processes understanding and techniques always come through.
Knowing when to finish a drawing is one of the hardest parts of drawing really. Sometimes I like to leave the drawing for a few days so I've completely forgotten about all the nuances involved that comes with the drawing process and so I can simply look at it as a finished piece of work in itself. But as a study, I think I said everything I want to. I could probably keep adjusting this drawing for months, finding new things to change and move around. But that wouldn't make for a particularly interesting video. So I want to thank you for joining me today and I hope you've taken something away that you can use in your own work. And until next time, happy drawing.